so you guys on the stream can see what's going on. What is going on? The Viper versus Dagao, and we are ready to go. This is going to be uh, a great matchup, I really hope. Um, we've seen the Viper play once already this tournament. That was versus Tato in round one, but now he is back versus Dagao in round two for Battle uh, for Anchor. Which is, of course, played on the brand new expansion pack for Age of Empires 2 HD Edition, the Rise of the Rajas. So the players here today will be playing the new civs on a wide variety of maps, and hopefully we get to see, of course, some of the new unique units and whatnot. And speaking of new things, this is going to be the first game in the tournament thus yeah. far where we've seen the Vietnamese. I'm fist bumping right now. I've been doing it for the last 10 seconds because... Yes, Vietnamese, we've not seen them yet, and uh, they're in the hands of the Viper. I know there's uh, a huge amount of uh, Vietnamese fans of Age of Empires 2. A fun fact for you, um, Age of Empires 1 regularly has 10,000 plus viewers in uh, from Vietnam. It's huge over there. They love AoE 1. Uh, they also love AoE 2, and finally, the Vietnamese have been included in the game. So uh, it gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. One second, let me just really quickly... Okay, I will continue. Right. Uh, so, Viper here, playing in the blue. He's playing as the Vietnamese. And down to the south, once again, Dagao playing as the Burmese. The Burmese showing up a lot in this series, or in this tournament so far. Indeed they are. We've seen so much of the Burmese and Khmer, but we haven't actually had a chance to see the Vietnamese yet, which have a very unique set of bonuses. But then again, so do all of the hmm. other civs. The Burmese, uh, so what the Vietnamese have is they actually reveal their opponent's starting positions at the start of the game. So this reveals every town center. And if we switch to the uh, the view of the Viper and we toggle on Fog of War, we can see that he knows exactly how far away Dogao is. And that type of advantage is actually quite big because if your opponent's close to you, then that determines how aggressively you should play in the early game. And it just gives you a lot of information. Yeah, they also have fantastic archers which is why I think Viper is very much going to enjoy playing with this Civ, because archers are one of the more um, you know micromanaged in intensive uh, units in the game, and uh, Viper loves to micro, what can I say? So uh, the archers for the Vietnamese get an extra 10% HP in Feudal, they get an extra 5% in Castle, and a further 5% in the Imperial Age. So their archers get very tanky over time, and they actually function much like the plumed archer for the Mayans, in the fact that they... Um, they will uh, tank a lot of arrow fire as well. Fun fact, they actually take exactly the same time to create as a plumed archer, and their elite upgrade also takes exactly the same amount of time to research. Uh -oh. They are fairly similar unique units. The rattan archer is an archer that just heavily resists all forms of arrow fire, but it does die quite easily to any sort of strong melee attacker with high pierce armor. And overall, the Vietnamese are just a, a strong, late-game, slow-style push sieve. A very strong late game army comp back with bulky battle elephants with 30 extra HP with Chatras, as well as their elite uh, Rattan Archer with Bombard Cannons. They have a decent barracks. Um, so, yeah, I hope that we get to see some of those things during this game. But really, the early game for the Vietnamese is all about taking advantage of that Archer Range HP bonus. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's something Viper's going to be very comfortable with, very happy with. Um, but yeah, I think I, w I would say that the um, the Rattan Archer, which is their unique unit, like we said, very, very good at dealing with other archers since they have high pierce armor. Uh, I would say it's more of an extreme version of the Plumed Archer, right? It, it It's more extreme. It has higher pierce armor, I believe, um, and it has Much more higher, HP yeah. as well. So it's a little more extreme, a little bit more specialized. Uh, as a result, it's weaker in other areas. But one thing I would like to talk about very briefly briefly here is the other unique technology for the Vietnamese, paper money. One of the most mm. interesting unique technologies, I think, in, in the game right now. I would completely agree with you. And a bunch of people have been asking in the chat how that technology works. So I will go uh, do the honors of explaining it now, now that there's actually a Vietnamese player in the game. So paper money, when you research it, it attributes 500 gold to each of your allies. The technology costs 800 food to research and 200 gold. In a single-player game, if you research that technology, you are trading 800 food and 200 gold for just basically 300 gold because you know it, it gives you 500 gold and you spent 200 initially on it, which is not a great exchange, but there will be some situations where you have to do that and that is actually a good trade-off. It gets the most value, though, in team games, of course, where you can turn you know 800 food and 200 gold into 1,500 gold divided among your teammates and 300 gold for yourself, but it could still be used in single-player matches or 1v1s. 
Yeah, I think that obviously the more players you add, the more valuable that re uh, research becomes because it is um, the same price no matter how many teammates you have. And the more teammates you have, the more gold gets given out. So it's a really interesting, unique technology. And I think it's like, um, it's one of those technologies that it, it, you, you have to kind of do it at some point. It's like one of those techs that, that has to happen um, at one point of the game. And that's something you don't get with a lot of the unique technologies. It's, it's very, very, well, unique. <laughs> It is. And it has quite a big impact in team games. But in a one versus one, it's going to be a lot weaker. And it's the type of thing that you'd only research in the super late game as a way to trade around some resources. Uh, we saw the Viper being a big bully, uh, taking advantage of a brief moment where Dugao did not have Loom on his villager trying to build that barracks. And he actually delayed that barracks significantly. The Burmese three militia rush is actually quite strong, or their men at arms rush, because once they get to the field age, they get an additional one attack in their infantry. And it just gives them a really smooth transition. Yeah, absolutely. Viper here, though, with a bit of a drush. He's not going for the, the fast uh, feudal mana arms play. Instead, he's going for the just all-out drush play. And uh, I think he said in his interview that he thought we'd see a lot of sort of mana arms and, and sort of early aggression. And that's exactly what he's going for here. Of course, we've not spoken about the map, but the map is Serengeti, which means it's basically unwallable, um, which suits Viper very well. And um, he's going to come in with these militia now. Indeed he is. And a defensive, perhaps, men-at-arms rush for Dogao. Just trying to get to the feudal age. He's almost there. He's about 60-70% of the way there. And he's going to have to defend against this three militia rush, but I think he'll be fine. Pulling a lot of villagers off the line will weaken his economy temporarily. But he oh. should be able to hold this. Oh. Is Dogao going forward in plain sight of the Viper? I think he is. Oh. He's sending, oh his my own, God. he's sending his own uh, militia out now as well. I don't even know if he's going to do Man at Arms. I assume he would, but if he loses a militia, then it might be a different story. Uh, and he's sending four villagers forward. If, if there's any map that you would do a forward, I mean, this has got to be it, right? Uh, that is indeed the case, but he's taking so much free damage on his militia and his scout because he's moving them in the same group. The enemy scout then being faster, doing a lot of damage for free. It's going to come down to some good focus fire to see who comes out on top of this engagement. And it looks like Dogao, with some absolutely excellent micro, will be able to clean this up, maybe without losing a militia. Wow. Yeah, I think I'm ahead of you. Um, I'm at 11 minutes and 7 seconds right now. Oh, uh, just a just... little ahead. We just watched that fight, and then you uh, you cast the fight after it happened. But still, you, were, <laughs> you we didn't cover it anyway, so it's all good, because um, Dugao did come out on top. I was right about the Man at Arms thing, though. He did decide not to do that, and I think that makes sense. <laughs> Instead, forward archery ranges. I like this a lot, but you know, there is a lot of risk that comes with going forward, and uh, this is the first forward we've seen in this tournament so far. And uh, you know, the risk that is involved is basically, well, if you lose your forward, you risk losing your buildings, and then you have to rebuild them back at home, and it could all just be a massive waste. Yep. You trade a very powerful offense for almost no defense, and it'll be very difficult for Dilgao to hold the line back at home if this does get pushed back. He will be able to zone the Viper probably off his Forage bushes, maybe delay the second arch range, we'll have to see. The Burmese forward is actually quite strong because of the additional uh, attack on their infantry and the free double bid axe that they get. Mm. This villager will actually barely escape. Yeah, the one back to the TC, alive with four health, which of course would have been a finishing blow had uh, this militia got one more shot in. And that's the nice thing about having that additional one attack. Uh, very nice. It would have secured him the kill, whereas uh, a militia without the extra one attack wouldn't have killed that villager with the extra kill. As it turns out, he didn't kill anyway. But uh, still, tower's coming up for Dugao now. And uh, this tower rush, coupled with this forward archery range and this like, high aggression, I, I like this style from Dugao. Oh, me too. And Serengeti is one of the most aggressive maps in the game. One of the things that I wanted to do, because I always like to focus on a little quality of life changes that improve the Age of Empires 2 experience for everybody, is I, I requested to the devs to change the acacia tree from 100 wood to 150 wood, and I feel like that makes Serengeti as a map a lot more playable. Uh, because before this, your wood line would recede away from you so quickly, and it would feel really unfair if you had bad wood. Still, though, this map is really aggressive because it's, impo it's almost impossible to wall, and the cracked sand reduces the HP of the buildings that you, you build on it. It shapes up to be a very, very rush-oriented game. 
Yeah, absolutely. And this is working great for Degal right now. He's denied those berries completely. Viper's been forced to wall in towards his TC to make a choke point. Obviously, Degal does not want to run under here. Otherwise, he risks losing his army. But right now, he's in a great position, piling on that pressure. We got a forward watchtower as well. And uh, even a forward blacksmith here. Degal's just kind of going all in with this forward. And I think maybe he's even going to build a mining camp on this stone. Um, <laughs> is he is he doing that? What's he doing with these vills? Is he gonna tower again on the on the wall? Yeah, he's gonna tower on the wall. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. He's gonna try and break through here. Viper just trying to buy himself some time and counterattacking over at uh, Degau's base. And as we said earlier, when you do forward aggression like this and get such a uh, high amount of aggression going out, um, you, you often leave yourself undefended. And, and Viper's making the most of that now. So basically, what you should do in a situation like this is exactly what the Viper is doing. Stall at home with static defenses. Your own defensive towers, palisade walls, houses. Just try and create a makeshift wall off and buy time while you simultaneously bring some of your own military units, go to your opponent's base, and really just punish him hard for going for that forward. Dogao has no real way that he can defend against this. No archer ranges in his own base, no defensive towers or anything. His wood line is going to fall to pieces. Yeah, the only thing I'd say right here is Viper's lacking fletching, so, um, mm. you know, he, he he's not killing those vills as quickly as he'd like if he had that, but, you know, Dugao now having to send some skirmishes back to defend, it's not the ideal situation, uh, but then again, you know, Dugao also doing good raiding on Viper here, Viper with a defensive tower, but hey, Dugao's army is still broken through, and uh, Viper here could be in the spot of trouble on this gold mine, uh, I think, though, that for now, Viper will be okay. This is such a stereotypical Serengeti game where both players are struggling just to get a safe wood line. Dogao only sent like two or three skirmishers back to his own base, which is actually means that it's going to boil down to some good micro uh, to take down these archers. These archers, critically for the Vietnamese, take one more shot to kill in the feudal age by enemy archers, which gives them just a little bit of extra survivability, but the Viper will be his own back. Dogao's base is safe. Can he keep the pressure on in the Viper's base? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he's got the hill, which is nice, but he still doesn't have fletching himself. So both players lacking the fletching upgrade right now, and Viper doesn't even have a, a blacksmith to, to do it. Dugao at least has the blacksmith, so that's something. Um, he's just trying to be a nuisance and, and set Viper back as much as possible, but those scores kind of flicking back and forth a little bit here as Viper uh, retreats his forward archers back and uh, focuses on just defending now. But hey, he knows that Degas very undefended and uh, he could very easily push back out once again to uh, try and counterattack. But Dogao wants to fix that. So he's building a defensive watchtower right now to protect his Baobab trees, which are worth 200 wood, which kind of compensates for how you know, sparse they are. Really though, the Viper moving his wood line up into the middle of his base, putting another defensive watchtower there. Now that's really good value for that one because that is going to protect his stone, his gold, and one of his main wood lines. And right now, he reached a little bit of a stalemate. Dogao no longer able to apply pressure, and he's actually going to throw away a huge chunk of his army trying to escape from the Viper's base. Oh yeah, under that TC, losing a few there. That, that was nice for, uh, for Viper, actually, and he's got a decent score lead now because of it. He's also sending a pretty big army across to Dugao's side of the map, and, you know, still without fletching, but he's got enough archers there that that is going to kill villagers, and uh, quite easily as well. Uh, great point about this tower, though. Really good value, um, covering a lot, and uh, Viper now actually getting a little bit of breathing room. Um, un uncontested uh, economy at the moment. So this game is going to get to see, basically, what's better? Three extra HP on your archer range units in the Feudal Age, uh, or is it better to have free double bid axe? And the answer is, is as the game drags on to the late feudal age, and it looks like neither player has any intentions of actually going to the castle age anytime soon, plus three HP is going to be a lot better once both players do indeed have double bid axe. The Viper moving into Dogao's base, denying that watchtower, killing quite a few gold miners this is an excellent trade for him. Yeah, I mean, that 3 HP, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you consider that that's 3 HP on every single one of these archers, your total HP pool is, is much higher. Uh, and, and that's actually going to have a significant advantage, as you say. The more uh, archers you actually create, the more valuable that becomes, um, which is very logical. But, you know, I feel like right now, um, Viper is failing to do as much damage as he would like. I think he needs to hit Dagao a little harder, to be honest. I mean, he got a few villager kills, but... He will be sent away by these skirms, and, and notice now how Dugao actually has fletching, whilst Viper is still only just building a blacksmith. Yeah, Dugao is very, very slightly ahead in the population department. Even though it looks like the Viper is applying a lot of pressure, like you say, it might not be enough. 
The guy has to be careful, though, with these three skirmishers to avoid them getting picked off, and it looks like he will pull back. Dogao has so much map control, so we'll have to see if he's able to take advantage of it, because those archers that he has boxed in right there have done so much damage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, doing a lot of damage to these these bills of uh, Viper's Woodline, and we, we kind of said, that, you know, this tile was good, it, it covered a lot, but uh, it depends which angle you look at it from, right? Uh, Vipers try to build more towers in this woodline, so clearly it's not as safe as we, we might have thought. And that fletching and plus one defense upgrade for Dugao having a really big impact here. Viper only just finishing fletching himself right now, and uh, he is bringing the rest of his army back home. But, you know, I'm really wondering if, if Dugao uh, is pulling himself way ahead here. I, I do think Dugao will click castle first. He does have more farms up at the moment compared to the Viper, and uh, Viper seems to be a little messy right now. Now. now, I did just adjust my own volume slightly, guys. I need you guys to let me know in the Twitch chat if that is correctly balanced now. Dogao with the skirmishers versus the Viper's archers means that he does have the natural advantage here. The Viper does actually get the HP bonus on his own skirmishers if he wants to transition into that. But by massing archers like this, I feel like he's leaving himself wide open for this massive skirm play. And it's really not allowing him to get to the castle age or anything anytime soon. He has almost no resources stockpiled in the bank. Dogao really pulling ahead. Yeah, I mean, obviously the skirms are great, and with that plus one defense, they're going to be even better. But I, I mean, my, right now, my main concern um, for Viper is that, yeah, he's building the archers, but what other options does he really have right now? I, he kind of has to do this, I feel. Hmm. Apparently, I'm still a little too loud. Yeah, I think I'm uh, too quiet. Actually, I'm. I'm going to reduce okay, your volume. I'm going to reduce your volume slightly so that they're showing a, a bit closer. Um, but yeah, I think I was too quiet. I edited my mic earlier, and yeah, <laughs> should be good now. Oh, okay. Well, you know what's not good? The Viper situation in this game. Uh oh, <laughs> not at all. As, uh, the Viper moving out with his own group of archers going to try and do some raiding. It's just the thing is, is, is that Dogao knows that the Viper's archers are moving out, so you lose that in the element of surprise. He might be able to pick off some own, uh, some villagers, but he doesn't have too much to defend himself. And the Viper wants to put down a watchtower to protect this wood line, and he will end up losing a bunch of villagers here with only one villager building that. Uh, I think we're looking at different parts. Oh, yeah, I see. You're talking about this watchtower. At the same time yeah, at the as top, this, yeah. at the same time, oh, yeah. Viper's coming in and, and taking out villagers on a, a watchtower from Dagao as well. So it's very much like a you know, base racy kind of situation. Uh, well, it's not really base racy, but you know, both players are attacking each other's bases at the same time. Um, and Dugout here, hemming Viper in, like he's trying to surround him with towers, I think, and just prevent the Viper from sending these counterattacks out without... Dugao seeing. Uh, he wants to be able to know if Viper's sending the counterattack because then he can deal with it and then he can just focus on uh, on keeping the Viper hemmed in and keeping the Viper where he wants him which is uh, in this tiny portion of the map which Viper's only just managed to carve out for himself. Part of me is really wondering why uh, the Viper is going for mass archers not mixing in his own skirms as a way to hold the line here and I think that the answer is that it's an economy thing. Like his gold is incredibly safe but his wood is not his wood is being pressured on all sides. It's being denied from him at every single turn. So he has gold he can burn. So he can, he can burn that on archers. But making skirmishers is going to be quite difficult for him and require him to build additional farms as well. I just don't think he's able to afford it. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, he can't really afford to be putting down or reseeding farms right now. Viper has just, um, let me just see real quick, uh, 10 lumberjacks, which isn't a lot. And they keep getting forced away from the wood as well. Like, no wood line for Viper is safe. This tower here from Dugao is denying all of this. And he's only just managed to get back onto the wood at the north side with this tower uh, there in defense. So Viper has a big wood problem. And uh, right now, Dugao... <laughs> Uh, we'll be very close to the castle age as well, and I think once Dugao hits castle, I, I can see him very easily um, closing this game out, to be honest. We were talking about bad wood earlier, and the Viper certainly has a case of bad wood where he has to put three watchtowers yeah. just to protect those acacia trees, which will recede away from him so very quickly, even with the additional wood. The Viper is just not in a position where he'll be able to get to the castle age anytime soon, and I think that's when this game will end. I've seen too many games of Age of Empires 2 where one player is just boxed in his base, taking so much damage. Look at Dugao's economy. 
He is actually very close yeah. to being able to get to the castle age. And also, a uh, thing to note here as well is that Viper has taken more stone this game. He's been forced to build more watchtowers. Uh, uh, Dugao's mm. built four, while Viper's built six, which means that Viper has spent a lot more stone on these static defenses, which isn't really that useful as the game goes on. Okay, it's important now, and he has no choice but to build these if he wants to save wood, but as time goes by, I mean, they're less and less valuable, and uh, yeah, I mean, that could be the extra stone that he the extra stone he gathered for these towers sorry could be uh, invested into other things right now like food and gold uh, which he needs to go to the castle age yeah that's a very good point all those villagers could have been tasked onto something else and now Dogao on his way up to the castle age almost at 25 percent he's just really done a great job of boxing the viper in and forcing him into a suboptimal situation where all the viper can do is make archers which are naturally countered by these skirmishers the viper in some serious trouble at the same time, though, Viper is still trying to counterattack. He's going to do exactly what he can, to, uh, or everything he can, sorry, to, to uh, harass Dugao's economy. He'll kill one Ooh. villager. Uh, maybe he'll find some more. I mean, this is pretty potent now he's got um, Fletching. Viper also finishing up plus one defense as well. And he also clicks up to the Castle Age right now, too. Um, Viper then, he's on 5% of the way up to Castle, whilst Dugao is at 63. So Viper, perhaps not as far behind up to Castle as we thought, but it's still going to be quite an end edge for Dugao now. Ooh, that was a really good attack by the Viper, swinging around the back, trying to pick off as many villagers as he can. He got a couple. However, Dugao is prepared and moving in with an army of skirmishers. He does have the hill advantage. The Viper has to retreat here. The Viper finally getting a little bit of breathing room. Dugao still being a nuisance with his forward watchtowers. And well, the Viper might be a bit behind, but with a good attack, he could claw his way back into this. Yeah, one thing that Dugao's doing right now that I actually really like is he's preemptively building a watchtower on these baobab trees on the right side. You can see yeah, the Viper's that. cutting yeah. wood there, and he's thinking, well, if I just build this tower here, <laughs> he's only going to cut so far before he's in range, and then he can't grab the extra wood on the right side either. So Viper's got to come back here, I think, at the very, very north of his base to, to grab the wood next. But yeah, Dugao, Castle Age, and he is going to be upgrading those units. He is doing crossbow right now. He's doing elite skirmisher. He's doing bodkin arrow. And uh, Dugao's just ready to push this one through. I hope we see a siege workshop because then he can make some rams and take these towers down as well. And uh, who knows, potentially close it out here. Viper both bomb players, rushing the tower. Yeah, both players are fairly even in the population department. The Viper desperate to get some more wood and he will clear out that forward watchtower. This is a particularly interesting drawback of the Burmese, which is even though they have a very strong natural archer rush with the free double bit axe, in the Castle Age, things start to get a little bit awkward for them, especially in the Imperial Age too, because they are missing those archer defense upgrades at the Blacksmith. So he'll only be able to have padded archer armor on his elite skirms and his crossmen. And the Vietnamese archers are only getting better. And boy, are they. 34 HP for them right now. And when he researches crossmen, they'll have a very crucial 41 HP, allowing them to live that mangonel blast, take an additional hit from a knight without forging. It's a really huge threshold. Oh yeah, um, right now, I mean, it's only gone up by one. Uh, we just watched that happen. 33 in Feudal, 34 in Castle. Of course, the Crossbowman upgrade will give them a bonus HP. So there you go, 41 HP now. But um, that's, that's a lot of additional HP. And we said this before, it might not be a lot on one individual unit, but when you've got a total of uh, 29 ranged units, that entire HP pool is suddenly a lot, lot higher. And this could be where Viper manages to pull himself back into this game now. Um, However, I mean, Dugout does have Elite Skirmisher here. Uh, they are still going to counter the crossbows, not as effectively, but they still counter them at the end of the day. That they do. Dugout actually has a lot of gold in the bank, but not very much in the wood department. The Viper will be building a siege workshop. I think a Mangonel would actually really help him gain an advantage here. If he gets one good Mangonel shot, it could take out most of Dugout's troops be very cost efficient exchange for him. Dogao putting down a bunch of town centers. He actually has two back at his own base. And if we look at the Viper, so this is a dangerous situation for him because he could start falling behind economically. Oh yeah, completely agree. And and right now, I mean, Viper just needs to get himself that Manganel, and then I think he's going to feel confident engaging Dogao head on because yeah, he knows Dogao is probably going to take a big Manganel hit, and then his beefy crossbows will be able to clean it up. One thing I do want to say right now though is that it seems to me like while these games have been played, there's been no problems. Like, 
all of the games that we've cast so far, uh, there's been no problems at all. They've been completely fine. And I think it's literally yep. just spectating that was throwing the spanner in the works earlier on. Oh, yeah. I think that spectating with uh, any players that have high ping just has been completely mm. broken in patch 4.8. So hopefully the devs get on that soon because that's a bit unfortunate. But I'm really glad that the recorded games themselves uh, have been going really smoothly and we have a good workaround for that. Yeah. Uh, the I got to clean up a couple crossbows over there on the left side. Uh, I didn't see that actually. Only like I three. There are a couple dead bodies next to the double archer ranges. Mm, oh, right over here, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, over here. Yeah, got it. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 as far as I'm aware, there's actually been no drops between any of the players uh, once we stopped spectating. So I think that's pretty good news uh, for multiplayer anyway. Uh, a lot of people were concerned because they were saying, well, if it's lagging and stuff, it's going to be no good. But uh, as it turns out, it was our spectating which was causing the problem, which, okay, that's not good news and that's not a good thing. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, it does still mean that multiplayer is very playable. And uh, we can see that here because, you know, Viper and Dugau having a good time. Yep, they are. This has been a relatively smooth game. Animation's still a little bit weird, mm. but otherwise it has been pretty nice. And speaking of things that are nice, Dogao has a bunch of mangonels. He actually has two in his own base, and he's looking to box the Viper in. Will the Viper get any good pickoffs and lose his entire army? We'll have to see, because the Viper has two mangonels in his own base, too. Yeah, I mean, the question is, can you actually box anyone in on this map? It's, it's so difficult to wall <laughs> Not it. Not really. Uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to make a box. Um, but yeah, Dugao hit three TCs right now. He's looking very good in economy. Uh, Viper on the other side of the map, still only on the one TC, and I, I think he needs to go higher aggression here um, to try and equalize things out. But this is dangerous. Look at this. Uh -oh. Mangonel's coming in. They're closing in on both sides. Viper uh -huh. needs to do something. Nice split. Uh -huh. Takes a bit of damage from the, uh, the Mangonel on the bottom of the hill. Uh, the extra HP really going to help out in this situation. And he does manage oh, to get wow. out, taking out one Mangonel, taking quite a lot of damage from these skirms, but I don't think Dugao has um, ballistics, so ultimately, uh, Viper does manage to retreat out of there in relative safety, if you could call losing a few units safe. <laughs> that is some really, really solid control there from the Viper. Uh, major props to him for not panicking in a situation like that, as one little misstep would have lost in the entire army and the entire game. It's just, despite how good his micro actually is, he was taking so much free damage from those elite skirmishers during that engagement, and even though he juked all his mangonel shots, was not enough. Speaking of free damage, he's taking quite a bit here while he yeah. waits for his own mangonels to come in range. Oh, but those mangonels, they could be potent. He's got to spot the mangonel from Digao. He will trade huh? one for one. And now Viper has an Mangonel advantage. If he gets a good shot here, this army will die. And obviously, the, all of these units are basically dead. However, Dugao with three stables and knights. The first time we've actually seen a single knight in this uh, tournament. <laughs> Those of you who watch competitive age vampires too, we all know that knights are completely useless. No reason to ever make them. I'm, of course, kidding. Knights actually are one of the things that really define the competitive metagame. Nice crossmen, very potent units. Nice, quite difficult to counter in the early castle age. And here they're going to be absolutely excellent as Dogao will box in that oh, yeah. army, pick off that mangonel, wipe out all of those units. And really just, the Viper has been falling behind economically. Dogao slowly pulling ahead in the economic department. And as a result, it's going to yeah. be very difficult for him to claw his way back if he's not winning with his military. And he just lost his whole army. Viper really needed to do some damage to Dugao there, and that's it. It's GG. He loses his entire mm. army of crossbows, and he calls it. Um, he knows at this stage, I think, that uh, Dugao has at least two TCs. Um, he probably assumes that Dugao has three. And uh, Viper back at home has just one town center, but he just lost his entire army on top of that. Not to mention the fact that he can see Dugao has plus two defense on his knights and bloodlines as well. So Dugao with three stables, really going to be pumping those knights out. And I just, there's no way Viper had a defense to that at this stage. Yeah, I think that Dugao made a really good decision to transition into knights there, and he just had a very strong counter army to the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese are very predictable. The thing that makes them so strong as a civilization is that archer range bonus, well, at least militarily. They have a lot of indirect strength in being able to reveal enemy positions, for example, but it's really those archers. And if you know that your opponent is going to be a shoehorn in a crossman, and if you can really pressure that wood line to make sure that he is only able to do that, then things like knights, elite skirmishers, and some mangonels can just really put the nail in the coffin there. So well played there from both players. GG. Oh, yeah, I completely agree. And um, honestly, Dugao played a great game. I mean... He's a fantastic mm -hmm. player, and you know these. This is a best of one sort of series, so 
anything can happen, and Viper now actually going to drop down into the lower bracket. Degau will advance to the semi-finals. Um, great news for Degau. Obviously, Viper now not in a great position. He's one loss from elimination. He can't afford to lose another game this tournament. Uh, but you're totally right about the Vietnamese. I mean, they are... Well, I, this is the thing. The Vietnamese, they are very predictable, and I think they can be potentially very strong in the late game, um, but I think they work more as a team game civilization than a standalone civilization. Um, their units, for example, like the Elite Imperial Skirmisher, which is available to all of their allies, it's amazing in team games, especially in the late game. Um, their paper money tr um, technology, it's very much a team game bonus or technology. Um, the Rattan Archer, it can work in single player, but, oh, sorry, 1v1, but I think it also works extremely well in team games as a support unit uh, and a frontliner mm -hmm. to, to combine with something else. I feel like the Vietnamese need to combine things together in order to be very effective. And standalone, I, I do think they fall a little short, to be honest. I completely agree with you on that analysis. I feel like the Vietnamese are strongest in a team game where they just have, they offer so much utility with all their bulky units. But on their own, a lot of their units are situational. Same with their bonuses, too. So it's really nice to have other civilizations that are able to compensate for those weaknesses and complement your own army. And here, the Vietnamese just fell a little bit short. Didn't really have the impact in this game that they hoped. And I mean, if we look at the economy tab and the achievements, we see, once again, you know, the Viper, he only had safe gold. And this really just made the Crossman problem for him even worse. And I think Dogao just took you know, really good advantage of it. And the Viper had so many excellent moments, but... Yeah, Serengeti yeah. is a really tricky map to play when you're getting forwarded that hard. <laughs> it's ruthless and it's completely brutal. But we're going to throw it over to Nilly now. He's going to be doing some analysis for us, so uh, he can take it away. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> and again, I'm trying to show you what happened here and why did Viper get so far behind. So, as we all know, Burmese getting the plus one attack in Feudal Age for their militia. So, the MA rush with towers is so super strong. And you can see Dogao absolutely went for it. Had to do the fight before, but won it convincingly. And therefore had the chance to actually kill some zebras. Then... Also, the bushes were in front. Dugal was able to kill all the ostriches, or at least take the villagers off there. We can see how this developed by the offensive tower. And suddenly, the viper, who was planning on getting zebras, ostriches, and the berries up front, was without any food. He had so much idle to see. Look at this. At this moment, after those three villagers go back to the TC, he had one farm. And then he built three extra farms. We will see a fourth one coming up here. And he was sticking with those four farms for the next roughly eight minutes. His villager production wasn't constant. He never had a possibility to go for fletching. So all his runarounds never did anything. Look at this. It's so tough for him to continue. Oh, it's actually a fifth farm. But it was so tough for him to get anything done when it came to food eco. He couldn't go for skirmishes, therefore could never ever take a single fight. You can see he was trying to run here and um, did some nice damage, but those just small skirmishes here could easily... The, uh, where are they coming? Oh, I'm missing them now, okay. But n never mind. Small skirmishers amount, um, amounts could actually scare him away and that was just so weird that he had to stay on archers all game long. Obviously archers are super nice for Vietnamese, but only having a single unit as your choice and a person who can actually outcounter them. Ha! Ah, not the greatest um, position there for the Viper and therefore not able to take a single good fight all game long and yeah, then you can't really win against a world class player like Dugao. That's it from me. Thank you guys and back to Resonance Stream 2 and Zero Empires. All right.